This is For Advisors by Advisors. I'm your host, Evan J. Mayer, and today we have a very special guest to Mr. Bob Alger. Hello, Evan. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm great. Bob is the founder of Alger Financial and a financial advisor with Raymond James. Bob started his career at Edward Jones uh, almost 25 years ago, spent about 12 years there, and then spent the last 13 years with Raymond James. Bob, we've known each other just how did me and Bob meet. We actually got linked up uh, unexpectedly on a golf outing last year for the Raymond James charity tournament. We ended up winning it last year and we ended up winning it again this year. Back to back. So, uh, and Bob's story is actually quite interesting. I didn't know much about him the first time we played. I, I found out a lot more about him uh, before we played the, the the next time. And he's had tremendous success in the business so far and wanted to have him on the podcast to discuss a little bit about his journey. Bob, tell us a little bit about your history in the business. How did you get started? Why did you get started? And what brings you where you are today? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Evan. Briefly, I grew up in a a small town in Eastern North Carolina. And when I was a junior in high school, my dad decided to start his own business and took all of his finances and tried to start the, well, started this business. But just as soon as he got it up and running, he was diagnosed with lung cancer and passed away nine months later. So he died a couple months before I graduated high school and had put all his money into this business. We were able to sell it for probably pennies on the dollar and then, and my mother was an assistant school teacher. So she had to figure out how to raise me and my brother, who was seven years behind me. And I was about to go to college. So she got a little bit of money from dad's life insurance and got hooked up with a local financial advisor. And, and I knew going into school that I wanted to be in business somehow, but didn't really know exactly what that meant. And over the next four years while I was in school, I watched that advisor, not just help her with investments, but help her make decisions on what to do with whether they should pay off the mortgage, whether they should, what to do with dad's old truck, all these different decisions that are financial decisions, but not necessarily what you think of as kind of the traditional stockbroker idea. And as I, I learned more and more about that and saw what he did for my mother and how much he helped her, that I realized that, that was what I really wanted to do. So there weren't too many people wanting to hire a 21-year-old kid out of college as a in the financial advisor world. This was 1994, and supposedly we were in a recession because nobody was hiring advisors. Uh, so I ended up in banking for about five years and then started an office with Edward Jones and was there for quite some time before I uh, started my firm here. So banking, what did you do in the banking world? Yeah, so I started out as in the retail side, working in a branch became a branch manager, and then became a commercial lender. And then my last role was what they called a private financial advisor, which I was not, at the time, I was not licensed to be an investment guy, but instead I did lending and referred things to the trust department, to the investment person. And I'll tell you, there was a quick story I had. I was at the bank and I had, I was having lunch with this doctor and he had an extra 200,000 in his checking account. And I was like, doc, you got an extra... 200,000 in your checking account. It seems to be going up every month. You really need this money. And he's like, no. And uh, he says, I really ought to do something with it. And says, well, why don't we invest it in something like mutual funds? And he says, well, that seems like a good idea. So I hooked him up with, with the investment person at the bank. And the conversation basically went, hey, this is Doc. He's got an extra couple hundred thousand. We talked about mutual funds. The investment guy says, hey, that sounds like a good idea. Is that what you want to do? He says, yeah, that's what I want to do. So he put 200,000 mutual funds and A shares. The advisor probably made $6,000. I got lunch uh, and I realized I'm on the wrong side of this. And and I knew that, that being in the investment world with the bank wasn't what I wanted to do. So, so what brought uh, you to what time, brought you to Edward Jones? Yeah, well, honestly, the the advisor that helped my mom was with Edward Jones. So you joined uh, his, did you join like his team at the time? No, he was he was 3 hours east to me and and I I moved to Raleigh about nine months before I started with Edward Jones and in my, again, this grand market research, I've grown up on the coast of North Carolina, that the only people that I knew that had money were from Raleigh. So I figured if I was going to be in the investment world, that uh, I better move to Raleigh. So there you go. And, uh, and so you started an office with Edward Jones. You were there for a long time. I was, what, yes. Edward Jones is, is funny because 
over the last five to 10 years, we're seeing a mass migration from them to independent firms, because I think a lot of the Edward Jones people tend to be entrepreneurial to some extent. And so then they get that itch and they leave. What caused you to decide to leave and, and look towards independence? Well, part of this is, remember, it was 2012. So some of the things that Edward Jones offers today, they did not offer then. And they've only just started to do some of the things I wanted them to do. Part of it was recognizing that I could run a portfolio with the best mutual funds from 10 different fund companies, and and it outperformed every model that I had with one fund company, but I couldn't do that at Jones. I didn't have the ability to make my own portfolio decisions. They were taking that away and uh, moving everything to models that were run by the home office. And I just felt like I could do a lot better than that for my clients and that I could control risk better than that. So it really came down to the investment control. And when I moved over and uh, very quickly realized all the things I didn't have access to at Jones, and it ended up being a great decision. So what was the tipping point? Was there like a time in 2011, you're just like, I just got to get out of here. And then what made you specifically choose Raymond James at the time? And has that lived up to the promise? I mean, you're still here, still happy at Ray J. So tell us a little bit about that transition. So as I became a, a top producer at uh, Edward Jones, I got to know the upper management a lot better uh, and was very disappointed that how the financial advisors were basically like cattle and they had no interest in the individual advisor. It was more about the number of them that they could get on to improve the, the general partner's returns. And that, and you realize just how impersonal the business was and there just was no level of caring as the further up you got. So that helped that along with the investment side made me realize I could just do better for my clients. So everybody that I had ever known that had left that was good at what they did went to LPL. So I just assumed I was going to go to LPL. And I figured, hey, I really ought to check out a couple different firms and visited LPL, I visited Raymond James, because I did have a friend who had moved over a couple of years before to Raymond James, but I didn't hardly anything about him. And then also looked at Commonwealth and I visited all three. And honestly, Raymond James just really, they took all the information that I shared with them and when I visited with them, they knew everything about my business. They knew the things that I was looking for. They put me in touch with the right people to be able to give me the success that I needed. And the other firms just didn't really seem to care a whole lot whether I came over or not. Everybody pays bonuses nowadays to move. And Raymond James was the third out of three as far as what they would pay. But they just seemed to really care about me growing my business. And it's, again, it's worked out well. That's excellent. And so you've been at Ray J for a long time. I was actually looking back at your numbers a little bit, and, and I didn't go all the way back to 2012 and 2013, but by 2014, you were producing 970. Two, year, two years later, you were up to 1.2. Three years later, by 2019, you were up to 1.7. 2020, you hit 2 million. At 2021, you had a humongous leap, as many in the business did, due to market performance and also probably some stuff in there. You got up to 2.6. 2022, you hit 2.9. And then last year, you finally hit the $3 million mark, which is awesome. And I looked at your trajectory for this year, and your numbers are significantly better. And I think one of the things that I want to point to on that growth, that transitional growth that you had, is I don't think you ever sat and just rested on your morals. You kind of kept saying, I'm going to keep <laughs> growing this thing. And your numbers, based on where you fit in the firm, you didn't stay put uh, at that number with residual growth. You kept growing up. And I think your number... 65 now in the company at a 44,000 something advisor. So phenomenal right. growth. Talk a little bit about when you got over here, some of the business decisions you made. Now, I, I noticed initially you didn't join a turnkey branch. You kind of created your own branch from the start. What made you have that decision? And then from there, what's happened in the last 10 years that caused you to go from a guy doing 970, which is a really good number to a guy doing over $3 million in revenue? That's a good question. There's a lot in there. There's a lot of ways we could answer that. I would say that after being at Edward Jones for a dozen years or so, and having started a branch from scratch there, where I was literally knocking on doors for two years, asking people for money, and picked out my own office and upfitted my own office and hired my own staff to go work for a team, go work for somebody else, just wasn't even didn't even cross my mind. So instead, I found an office space that was a couple of miles from my old office. It was an empty shell. I bought it, upfitted it, hired staff, 
and start it over from scratch, which is probably the hardest way to do this, but it just seemed like the right thing to do so that I would still be the boss and I would still be able to make my own decisions and I wasn't reporting to somebody else. So that's the main reason I did it the way that I did it. As far as the growth is concerned, I think it's recognizing that there are some things that I do really well and some things that we're not very good at. So I have focused on the things that I do well and I've hired people to do things that I don't really like doing a whole lot and but are important in the business because they'll do it better than I can and they'll do it with more emotion, more purpose th than I will. And then I can focus on things that I do well and just do it over and over again. So would you say, I, you, you do have four members on your team. And by the way, the, the two advisors, basically one planner and then one support staff that runs your office operations. It's a nimble practice. And at, at your production level, it's actually quite unique to be that nimble. When did you decide, hey, I, I'm sure you had an assistant pretty early on, I'm guessing. That, and then when did you say it's time to bring on a, a, a junior advisor, kind of help mentor them, bring on a planner? When did you start having those thoughts? And then, and that's pretty much from when I'm seeing when you hired some of these people, that's really when the production really started to increase sub substantially is you kind of changed your mindset a little bit there. Well, when I transitioned over, I had no idea if anybody was going to come with me. Edward Jones is not a what they call them, protocol firms, where you can take anything with you. I had a list of clients and phone numbers, and that's all I had. So I didn't know if anybody's going to come with me. So I brought, I actually brought an Edward Jones advisor over with me with the goal of, of her being a planning advisor, doing my goal planning and social security analysis and those kind of things, which I'm not really a big fan of doing. And the two of us actually started the firm and she was, she's a wonderful advisor and, but she'd been with the firm, she'd been with Edward Jones like 18 months. She was really good at what she did, but the firm was just putting her in a position that she was never going to be able to recover from by giving her too many households, but that's a whole different story. But it was the two of us for about a year and all we did was transition people over. And then we did hire our first support staff and that person actually didn't work out. So then it was back to two of us again for a little bit, but then we uh, got lucky and we found Kim now almost 10 years ago, I guess. And, and she's been, been great and been, been with me the whole time. That original advisor since retired during COVID decided to, to go back and, and raise her kids, which is a, it's a very commendable decision, honestly. Uh, but we we're able to replace her with another female advisor who does all of our planning and social security analysis and Medicare and long-term care and all of our insurances and those kind of things. And, so, and, br and bringing Erica board, the yeah. junior advisor, that I, I've seen the numbers really help you grow um, there. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that phase. Yeah. So in 2018, I hired Eric. Eric was my banker at, at the local bank that helped me buy my building. And I'd been talking to him a little bit ever since that, that he really ought to get out of banking and do something that could be more lucrative. And the next thing, probably five years, five, six years later, I had convinced him to come over and, and start from scratch with me. So he got licensed under my umbrella and we carried him and he kind of built an office. Or, well, so they built a business from scratch with my help. We gave him a few clients and we still give him some as time goes on, but he's been doing a great job of building this under the Alger Financial Umbrella and Raymond James. And now it's become more collaborative where he has a niche that he works closely with, and I have a niche I work closely with. And if we get somebody referred to us that really falls into his niche, he ends up getting being the advisor and getting all the compensation from it and all those kind of things. But excellent. And so your revenue's grown now. Your book of business is primarily fee based, if not ninety nine point nine percent fee based, or, or right. a pretty high number at this point. The RIA thing has been coming around. People are constantly talking about going RIA now, straight RIA. I'm guessing thoughts have entered your mind before on that. What Have you looked go, at going towards RIA? And if not, what are some of the things that you, you've thought about? And are you kind of in a space where you're just growing so well and Ray J is such a great support, you know, that you just want to keep building from here? Well, Ray J does a fine job supporting me, so I'm not really concerned about that at all. The main reasons that I've heard people going over to this full RAA deal is either if they're later in their career and kind of cashing out and need a succession plan, or 
Some have talked about a higher payout. And then the last one I hear about is control of your data, meaning they want to be able to slice and dice and analyze their portfolios better than they feel like they can do under Raymond James. And at this point in my career, none of those are really attractive to me. So I haven't really looked at it. I've had I fielded plenty of calls about it. I've had plenty of people reach out, but but it's not something we're really considering right now. I don't know. I just think there's plenty of other things we can do to grow and I can do to make the business better without having to jump to the RAA side. And I'm a, I'm under full agreement. So I'm, I, I don't see any true extra added value other than making a little bit more money. But at the same time, your ability to grow, Ray J definitely helps with a lot of the background stuff that would be a little bit complicated. Talk a little bit about the future. Do you have a vision as far as what where you want to see Alger Financial in a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, I, my guess is, and I, I could be completely mistaken, as my revenue's grown, I'm no longer necessarily focused on growing my book organically. I'm now looking inorganically. I know there are some advisors that would rather more organic growth. Where do you fit on that side of the spectrum and what's the future life for you? Well, I've always said that about every five or six years, that your practice will look completely different than it did five or six years before. And it's not something that happens overnight, but it's as the world evolves and what people are looking for changes and what your needs, how your needs change. So it may mean adding an employee. It may mean offering a new service that we didn't offer before. Going forward, I think what we'll probably be doing, and we're kind of going through some of this right now with Eric and some of the rest of the team, is... With the clients that we have and we'll continue to bring on, probably just offer more services to them uh, to make the relationship even stickier, uh, which will probably involve uh, tax planning and tax services. Um, we do a very small version of that today, but we don't prepare returns, which I think would be just kind of the icing on the cake if we did that as well. And I think we're doing everything we can do in the money management side. I feel really good about that part. I think it's all these kind of ancillary services that we can add, and that will mean having more people, but I don't think it has to happen overnight. So we're kind of starting to work through some of that, and that's probably not a one-year goal. It's probably three or four years down the line. I could see us really involved in that. Um, and I see what uh, you're saying there. I mean, the concept of where you build, I mean, things can change quite often in a year or two, and... I, I can tell you in my, in my personal experience, my practice was completely different two years ago than it is today. And I, I don't even think practices look stupid. Or I, I always use the expression, I think you said your business will look different every five years. I always say, we look back at the advisor we might've been two years ago, five years ago, and we look back and if we don't say that's a stupid advisor, well, then we haven't grown, right? What are we right. doing different today? Either portfolio management, and you're right, you get to that part of portfolio management it's at a perfect peak. Now, what can we add in tax services? seems to be a great idea and a great extension to that. As far as the future of your growth goes and, and kind of what you plan on doing and where you plan on being, I mean, you're, do you ever get to a point of satis satisfaction? We always used to claim that if an advisor hit a half a million dollars of production or a million dollars of production, they get to that point of, I'm satisfied now. I, I brought in the revenue. I've never experienced that. We're going to surpass 2 million myself for this year and our, for our branches over 3 million this year. These are big numbers that five years ago I would have died for, but now I'm like, eh, that's small. I want to get, I, I, I want to continue to grow. Do you still have that passion for growth or, cause you just passed the $3 million mark personally. That's a, a, a huge number. Do you feel like you still have a lot more you want to grow into at this point? Or are you kind of at that point where you're, you're kind of liking where things are? Evan, I know, and you should be very proud of what you've done with both your personal business and the branch. Being able to grow to a $3 million branch is a really a fantastic thing. So many times, you're exactly right. You see people, you see advisors that uh, hit that million dollar mark. That's not even that far sometimes. And then suddenly they're like, well, I'm going to work 20 hours a week now. And I don't really get that. I mean, I sure, I enjoy working. I enjoy having time off, but... Uh, I think that you can, I'm trying to, what, what I've been trying to do for the last five years or so is to make my work life and my out of work life very similar so that I'm doing the things that I enjoy doing. They just happen to be with clients and I'm kind of doing work all the time, but I'm doing it for fun. And 
And sure, maybe it's around the golf or maybe it's a little fishing trip or maybe it's some of those kind of things or in our case, the Carolina Hurricanes game, but I'm doing it with people that I enjoy doing it with and it all just kind of works. So I, I don't, I think that continues to drive revenue though and it continues to grow the business. I'm just having more fun. And and I've got such a great support staff here. If If it requires working hours for me to do some of those kind of things, they can take care of some of the day-to-day the -day stuff. So I really don't see us slowing down. I see that we could certainly have a lot of growth from here. I am I'm more disappointed that other people aren't growing as fast as I am than the fact that we've done something really that unique. I just think that we've I've continued to be on the same trajectory for most of my career. And the fact that other people aren't keeping up, I don't think is a Bob issue. I think it's their issue. Do you stay competitive? Like at this point, are you competitive with the concept of watching other advisors practices and trying to compete? Or is that not even in your psyche? I'll tell you that the whole top 100 thing didn't interest me at all. Being in the top 100 advisors at Raymond James, even though we hit it and have kind of blown right through it, it's nice. And I recognize that we were close to the goal. And, and as we got close to it and we finished something like I don't know, it was, I think last year was 95 or something, and this year we're well beyond that. But, and I will tell you that I know where my close friends are, just, but that doesn't mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm super competitive. So it's not like when I was first starting in this business and everything was commission-based and every month they would send out a report of everybody in our area and the, and the money they made that month, that was competitive, but it wasn't necessarily a good competition because it was all commission-based and if I needed to sell something at the end of the month in order to get on the, they used to send out this newsletter that would fold in the middle. And I just wanted to be in the top half of the fold. That was mm -hmm. my goal. I wanted to be in the top half of the fold, even though it was very early in my career. But that was not good competition because I, well, I thought my morals were strong enough that I didn't have any issues. I saw plenty of other people that did things that were not in the best interest of clients because of the competitive mode that Edward Jones put us in. Yeah, well, I don't have that issue anymore because of the fee-based idea. So it's just a matter of helping as many people as we can with as much money as we can. Yeah, maybe goals change a little bit to AUM instead of instead of revenue per se. So that makes yeah. sense. What would be yeah. some advice you would give to some new advisors, either either some new advisors getting in the business or some advisors that where you were with Edward Jones or in one of those positions that are potentially looking to break out? I would say if you're somewhat new to the business, you want to make sure that you can be a important part to a team. Find out what it is that, that you really like doing, whether it's research, whether it's client meetings, whether it's helping to understand how to put portfolios together. There's going to be something that, that really kind of gets you excited and, and hopefully you can find your niche in that team. And then if you're part of a practice or, or you've built an office like I did with Edward Jones and like you did, and you're trying to figure out what the next step is, gosh, especially if you're like an Edward Jones or a Northwestern Mutual or some of these folks where you're a little bit captive, it's just so worth looking uh, at either a company like a Raymond James or an LPL where you can really do your own thing and, and really create a niche that you just can't do at a place like that. I think it's just always being open for opportunities and making sure you keep your eyes open. That's To me, that's the most important thing. Absolutely. There's never a wrong decision, okay? <laughs> right? You got to keep growing in this business. So Bob, it was a pleasure to have you on. If an advisor or anybody runs across this and has a question or two for you, is there a good way to reach out to you? And what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the stuff that we talk about is on the website, which is algerfinancial.com, A-L-G-E-R financial. Well, that's a great way to do it. And you can contact us through that as well. And we're happy to, to have conversations, if, especially if you're looking to do something different. Awesome. So reach out to Bob if anybody has any questions. Bob, thanks again for coming on. Hope, hope, hopefully we see you. You might not be competitive, but I'm competitive for you. And I want to see you in the top <laughs> 10 in the next five years. So we, we got to get you to the top 10. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to push for that. Thanks for joining us today. And for the advisors out there, hopefully you learned, uh, you picked up one or two good things from today's podcast. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.